Well, good evening, everybody. Um, this evening, um, I'm going to be attempting to use this new technology to the best of my abilities. Uh, it worked great earlier, and of course, through a snafu at us right at the last minute, but we'll get through. The only difficulty is, is that now the notes are to my right rather than to my left. So there are times I'm going to be looking away from the screen just so that I can uh, refresh my memory. Uh, this evening we're going to be exploring the Link Cather's World War II poster collection exhibit that's currently on display at the museum. Uh, if you weren't aware that we're open, we are uh, Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to noon. And then we close for an hour and re-sanitize the museum and we're open from 1 to 4 in the afternoon. Uh, we do advise that uh, if you want to make sure you can get in, please call and you can reserve uh, a spot, a particular hour to come in. Um, and the other thing I'll mention is that um, we are dealing with COVID uh, issues. So we've had to remove the hands-on exhibits that we set up a couple years ago. But if you want to come in and see the uh, Let's All Fight World War II poster exhibit, that's something you can come in and do. The posters are so much bigger and more impressive in real life than they are online or even what we're seeing this evening. Uh, I suggest that you do it if you can. Um, our crowds are not big. Most times there's uh, nobody here or a couple people at a time. So uh, we feel is pretty safe. Just advise you, please uh, bring a mask when you come in. If you don't have them, we have them right at the reception desk. So without further ado, let's get into our talk this evening. Um, first of all, I do want to take just a moment to uh, recognize the funders for this project, uh, the Leo Cox Beach Philanthropic Foundation, the Waldo T. Ross and Ruth S. Ross Charitable Trust Foundation, and the Tuba Family Foundation. We also received some support for our programs from Humanities New York, with support for the from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and now I have to say, any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this oh, it should be program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. So let's move on. Let's see some of these posters. I think uh, one thing I want to keep in mind is uh, what people's world was like uh, leading up to World War II. Um, nowadays, we have instant information coming at us from a variety of different sources, but then much of what they saw was visual. Uh, there were magazines, newspapers, those are the two major forms of communication, the other one being radio. So this exhibit I think is particularly interesting because it's one of the major ways that the government had to communicate with people at that point in time. So this poster here was the one that really captured um, my eye when I was first started working on this project. I was looking for one that really captured some of the, the themes that I found in World War II posters at large. Um, and I wanted to just point out a couple of those things while we're here. Um, after the US government entered the war, they recognized that they had to unite the nation to fight their enemies. And uh, not only did that mean that they had to gear up to support the troops, but they had to sway public sentiment. Leading up to World War II, there was a fairly significant portion of the American populace that was kind of anti-war. They did not want to get entangled into a, in a war that was happening somewhere else in the world. Then lo and behold, we're in the war. So all of a sudden we have to gear up to fight that war. They knew that it would be a monumental undertaking to raise the funds, to develop the materials, the weaponry. And so they decided they had to undertake a campaign to raise the money and build public support. If you look at a lot of the posters that were developed by the government to do this, uh, they showed um, tough men. I think this, particular poster really captures that. Um, he's aggressive, he's tough, nobody's going to stop this guy. And that was definitely an image that they wanted to convey. It's very optimistic, um, it's aggressive, it's determined, 
And as we'll see in some of the posters, often you'll see lots of muscles and fists, uh, military equipment. It was all to suggest the same idea that the United States was strong. The other reason I found uh, this poster particularly intriguing is because it, it has different elements that speak to the different themes that you find in the World War II home front posters. If you look at the image on the left hand side, in the background of this fighting soldier, you see images of people from different lines of work. You actually see women and a man working in a factory. You see a guy that's welding in the lower left hand uh, corner behind the uh, the rifle butt is a farmer. And, and these are suggesting that these people are as necessary to the war effort as the soldier is. They're playing their part too. That's why the title of it, Let's All Fight, really fits well with this particular poster. If you look at the right-hand side, I'll just point out that these posters were made by actually over 2,000 artists, all told, uh, by the end of the war. And uh, they were working from sources that they had available. Um, somebody pointed out to me that, hey, that guy's not wearing a World War II helmet. It's not, it's actually a World War I era helmet. And the US government, uh, the military had already moved away from this helmet before World War II even started. But the artists that were given the task of coming up with the visual uh, material that would be used for these posters, they were using images that they had from the past. That's what they had to work with initially. We'll find out in later posters, of course, they're using helmets that would be appropriate for that time period. I mentioned the fists. Here's a great one, Avenge December 7th. Uh, it came out in 1942. Um, and it's referencing uh, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor that brought the US into the war ultimately. And uh, images like this were in, supposed to encourage a couple feelings among the viewers, anger, patriotism. Um, and if you look at the poster on the right, here they're using a very different approach to build support and actually in this case, raise money through selling war bonds. They have a soldier who is brandishing a big flag. So it has lots of energy red, white, and blue, those are colors that came to meet pa mean patriotism. So this poster really captures that idea. And you'll find used over and over uh, in the posters, red, white, and blue coloring in many of them, you'll notice. Uh, you'll see V signs. And in some of the ones that have much more of a negative uh, meaning to them, they use swastikas. These are things that came to me mean things to the American populace. The other thing that I uh, found in working on the exhibit, you know, the posters themselves sort of some have their literal meaning, others have symbolic meanings, but I wanted to find a little bit more information. And one of the questions that came to mind is who were these artists that created the posters? And uh, the Avenged December 7th one was done by an artist by the name of Bernard Perlin, or is it Bernard? I'm not sure. It's hard to find pronunciations online, I've discovered. Uh, he was uh, born to Jewish immigrants from Russia. Uh, and he was hired in the early days uh, by the US government as part of the uh, Department of the Office of War Information. You find many of the posters were made by this particular branch of government. Um, back in 1942, when they were first created, uh, to take on this effort. Later in his career, or actually later in the war, he actually became a correspondent, an artist correspondent for Life Magazine and for Fortune Magazine, and actually covered the war front. He was right there on the front lines. Here are a couple more um, sort of typical home front posters that were using uh, the imagery of American soldiers to build support for the effort, back the attack. It's right to the point. Um, and then the one on the right, uh, there. it's later in the war. Uh, it's 1944. 
And uh, they're referring to the campaign uh, that was coming to actually attack Japan. The war in the Pacific had been particularly grueling. Uh, it took them months and months just to retake a lot of the uh, islands that had been captured by the Japanese in the early days of the war. There were a couple other artists involved in these. Uh, the one on the left, Back the Attack, was done by uh, Georgia Schreiber, who studied art in Germany and then came to the United States. Uh, when he first came here to make a living, he actually sold his drawings and cartoons to New York's daily papers, eventually established a reputation for his graphics abilities and was hired by um, the US government to make these um, war bond posters to raise funds. The other artist, James Bingham, was born in the US, in Pittsburgh. Uh, he became interested in art very early, at age three, supposedly. Um, he was a skilled, skilled uh, artist. And it's interesting, a lot of these people came from the graphics world. They were doing um, artwork for magazines, for advertisements, for um, company products. And he went on to do illustrations for Perry Mason and Tugboat Annie serials in the Saturday Evening Post. Here's a really large poster um, by that invasion bond. Um, and here the artist has had used imagery actually from D-Day uh, to make this poster, which is raising funds to support the ongoing campaign to eventually uh, push through to Berlin in the European front. Not all of the artists were well-known illustrators. Um, this is a small poster that was actually a recruiting poster for the Marines, the one on the left that's in the exhibition. And if you look in the, the lower right-hand corner, I sort of highlighted the artist's signature there, and all it said was, Guinness, Captain, U.S. Marine Corps. And I was like, who is Guinness? Well, I, I sleuth around online, and eventually I find out that his full name is William H. Victor, or Vic Guinness. At this point, when this poster is made, he was a captain and he ultimately ends up being a major, I believe. But after the war, there's almost nothing about him. I don't know where he lived, what he did. He was unknown, but it was one thing that's interesting about this is that quite often the posters would actually put down that it was a soldier and include his rank. It's a little um, confusing, because at times these were well-known illustrators that actually enlisted in the military and were creating these posters, and other times uh, they were just doing the work um, as part of their duties. They weren't all well-known though, as in the case of Vic Guinness. And I included a couple other of the posters, recruiting posters that he did for the Marines. He's only known to have done three altogether, so this may capture it. So what could you do besides uh, donate funds, buy war bonds, or actually uh, enlist in the military? They realized that this needed to be a nationwide campaign. They needed to get everybody involved. And one of the things that the posters encouraged people to do was to volunteer. And there's a couple posters here for the American Junior Red Cross uh, intended to recruit young people to volunteering in their community. The one on the left um, shows the, some of the variety of things that people could do as volunteers. They're trying to be suggestive. Uh, you'll see that in addition to a couple of soldiers there in the foreground, there's a nurse. Uh, there is a factory worker there, a guy, I think he has uh, a tool over his shoulder there. Uh, the gentleman sort of in the lower center with a brown hat is a farmer. Um, but I thought, I'd also want to point out on this poster, notice the eagle. That's another symbol that's gonna, people are gonna see that, they're recognizing it, that's a, a patriotic symbol that people would have noticed. The poster on the right is another American Junior Red Cross uh, poster. It has a very different flavor to it. It's sort of 
um, portraying an ideal American community, which much of America was at that point, small town. You'll notice there is the church. Uh, there is a school building, I believe. Uh, the white building on the left is actually a Red Cross headquarters building. You'll notice field in the foreground. Uh, they are appealing to people in small towns across the country. And across the, the bottom are some of the the different things that people could do to um, volunteer in their communities. Uh, this, well, the one on the left is identified as being done by an artist named Walter Beach Humphrey. And uh, he had attended Dartmouth College, uh, studied art, and um, became a magazine illustrator. Uh, did work for a whole variety of magazines, uh, including the Saturday Evening Post. And um, it said of him that he developed a style that was uh, called lighthearted family friendly, co family friendly content. Um, maybe these posters are a little bit indicative of that. This poster here is actually very simple. It doesn't say a lot, but uh, is, is very symbolic. I'd mentioned way back in the beginning how they often used these as a symbol in their artwork. And here they've used the, the tailing plume of a plane that's been shot down to make a V for victory. And what I find interesting about that is the message is very, very simple. Worth fighting for, worth working for. Trying to suggest to people that the work they were doing here on the home front was as important as what the soldiers were doing on the battlefront. So what are some other things that people could do? Um, with all of the soldiers uh, joining up to fight in the war or moving to big cities to um, work in factories, fairly early in the war in 1942, the government realized they had a real problem is that there was nobody around to harvest all the crops and that food was absolutely necessary. So they formed the US Crop Corps and its purpose was to enlist women and young children, and not young children, young teens, aged 11 to 17, to leave the cities and take up uh, work on farms to help bring in those crops. Uh, this work was portrayed as being highly patriotic. And actually by the end of the war, one and a half million women and two and a half million teens had joined the Job Corps. And people locally might find this interesting about this particular uh, poster. It was done by Douglas Crockwell, a resident of Glens Falls, well known in this area, who would use local people as uh, models in uh, composing his uh, illustrations. He was um, best known for doing illustrations, covers for Saturday Evening Post, but also for many other magazines. And he had a whole long list of advertising clients as well. General Electric, Welch's, Wyeth, General Mills, Kraft Foods. Uh, the list went on. One of my favorite, the American Brewers Association even. Um, he did a whole slew of, of, post, of ads for them uh, after the war. There was also an effort to uh, recruit school students to support the war and the government set up a program actually, the Schools at War program, to encourage uh, student participation. And what I particularly like about this poster is it shows three different ways that students could get involved and participate. Uh, and you actually find this uh, really happening across the board in schools across the country, including here in Glens Falls. You have the boy on the left who has the model airplane. There's a real effort to uh, start training teenagers to ultimately become pilots. They could start out by making models, but there were training programs in the local community, uh, basically a pilot school for, uh, for teenagers. The boy in the center is collecting rubber to be recycled there's a big effort to re, um, recycle paper, uh, rubber, metal things. Uh, in Glens Falls, they had a big scrap heap in the middle of City Park. And that was something that students could do even in the elementary grades. They would have um, 
drives to collect paper and rubber goods. And then the, the girl on the right is selling war bonds. Uh, so one, two, three, they're all involved. It's interesting, uh, the artist that did this was another well-known um, illustrator, his name is Irving Nurek. And I think uh, the most interesting thing about him is that um, he actually made his career out of depicting pretty girls. Uh, similar to the one that you see in this particular poster here. In fact, he did a, a long series of illustrations for uh, subdebs in Ladies Home Journal. So in addition to recruiting students in the schools to be supportive of the war effort, there were posters that actually encouraged children to get involved as well. They didn't have to buy war bonds, um, but they could buy stamps and then put them into books and eventually the books could be then converted into war bonds. Of the 135 billion bonds sold, nearly 1 billion were contributed by children uh, by the end of the war. What I found really fascinating about this poster in looking at it is people would have seen the hat that's in the foreground, obviously would have been worn by her father who was a soldier. And the picture is this lovely picture of a mother and daughter doing something together. So it's quite uplifting. And yet there's a reason that's included there in the imagery, just to bring home the point that uh, everybody needed to help out. Interesting, um, this particular poster was done by an, a guy named Al Parker, who um, showed early talent as, a, as an artist and his grandfather, who was a Mississippi riverboat captain, paid for him to start college. In fact, Al, to earn money while he was going to school, was a jazz musician and he'd perform on the riverboats during the summer going up and down the Mississippi. Um, eventually he got a break uh, when he got a cover illustration for House Beautiful that really got him started and then he was able to continue working doing illustration for magazines. Another um, issue that the government realized is that they had to be getting the entire nation behind this war effort. And so they actually had a program to be reaching out to the black community. Um, there's two posters I included side by side just because thematically they're saying much the same thing, but there is a big difference between the two of them. Um, the one on the left is selling, um, convincing people to buy war bonds. The one on the right is using an African-American aviator to be appealing to the black community in America. Uh, and this individual is Robert Diaz. Uh, he's one of the first Tuske Tuskegee Airmen and uh, the, one of the first group of airmen that actually saw duty in World War II in Italy. And years after the war, he was interviewed, and I found this was really interesting to find this online, because he was able to speak to the racism that existed in the military at that time, but, but also as to how they dealt with it. And he said, among those in control, some wanted to see us succeed and others wanted to see us fail. For a while, the ones who wanted to see us fail had the upper hand. We couldn't get near combat, but combat came to us. Things didn't go the way they were supposed to in Italy, and we got to fight after all. At Anzio, we got the job of protecting the beachhead. After that, they couldn't ignore us. So another big campaign of the, the US government was to get Americans on board at producing uh, all the goods and weaponry that were needed by the soldiers on the front. This is a really large poster that it was actually done by Norman Rockwell. Um, it's, it's huge. You can see all the folds in it uh, that were in it originally. Um, and you find this theme repeated in many posters at that time. And that is that they needed for people to really be productive. 
in their factory jobs. Uh, it took many months to retool American industry to supply all the weaponry that was needed. And uh, they really were depending on American workers to be focused, to show up for work, uh, and to not slack off, to make sure they were doing everything exactly right so that they could achieve their goals. Um, we'll get to, we'll see another Norman Rockwell um, poster a little bit later, so I'm going to move on here. Here are a couple other posters that have to do with uh, American workers working to their utmost. Um, here you have a couple soldiers on the left-hand side that are quite desperate, you know, they need their weapon. Uh, give them the stuff to fight with is the message, work for freedom. Um, and the one on the right is referring to another part of the, the work workplace uh, message, and that was they didn't want workers to get hurt. If they got hurt, they lost time, it meant that production goals wouldn't be met. And uh, so that was sort of two parts of the same message to American workers. The government also had a campaign to be addressing um, racism in America. They recognized they needed to have all Americans participating in the effort. And they created uh, a number of posters that actually featured uh, blacks. And there are two of them here. Uh, the one on the left, United We Win, the message of that is quite clear. And they show uh, both a black and a white uh, workers who are working on a uh, P-47 Thunderbolt, supposedly. Um, and uh, this comes from the National Archives, as many of these do. On the right, there is more of a story. And uh, Obi Bartlett um, had been in the Army. And during the attack on Pearl Harbor, he was injured and he lost his left arm. He returned to California. And after recovery uh, in the hospital, he took a job as a welder. And um, actually his, um, there was some coverage of his experience in the newspapers and the federal government uh, became aware of it and decided to feature him in this poster. And it's interesting, he was actually awarded the Silver Star um, after the attention that he received, but not immediately after his actual efforts uh, on the battlefield. I should point out the Cather's collection actually didn't have any posters that dealt with African Americans. And it was something that I knew had happened because I'd read about it in other sources. So I actually went out and found these posters, uh, found sources for them online so that we could include that part of the story. I just, um, so there are reproductions of these posters that you can find if you come in to see the exhibit here, but we don't actually have the original posters. Just wanted to be clear about that. Another group that the, uh, the government realized that they had to recruit are women. And of course, on the left hand, left hand side here is a famous uh, Rosie the Riveter poster that many people have seen because it's been reproduced so many more times. Another poster we don't have, but I included it just to introduce this particular theme. The poster on the right is uh, one that we do have in the exhibit. I am part of this night. And um, between 1940 and 1945, uh, females in the workplace increased by 10 to 15%. And by 1945, one out of four married women worked outside of the home. This was a big change from just previous to then. And uh, it's interesting that in many of these posters, the women are depicted as being beautiful, even if they're in their work attire. They, you know, the bandana became a symbol of these working women, as well as their jumpers or whatever they might've been wearing in the workplace. Um, and I'll just mention here, uh, the artist of the poster on the right, Frank Bensing, um, he actually had 
already established his career working for a lot of uh, magazines, including Red Book and McCall's. And uh, what I want to do is actually read some of the text that is included below this poster, which was published by the Women's Home Companion. And uh, here I have it. Um, this woman, I'm sure it's a fabrication because they wanted to communicate the story, but she says, thank God I am part of this night, the busy night which stretches around half the world, enveloping him on his dangerous beachhead, lighting his pale instruments in far off skies. There's a deep and thrilling satisfaction in knowing I am really doing something. Never before in history has a woman like me been given a chance to fight a war and to make her fighting felt across every continent and sea. It's a very grand statement, but it gives us, a, uh, it gives us the idea of what it was like for, for women to go into the workplace. They were motivated to do it. Uh, the, the ads were very, um, very impressive, S successful too, if you see the numbers of how many did join the workforce. Uh, this is a different, a very different ad uh, for cadet nurses. Uh, and you can see some of the appeal here. It's the opportunity to have a career and the education was free. Um, so they got educated, had a career, very strong uh, recruitment poster. Another thing that's interesting about this one, and I, let me just go back one so you can sort of see a difference too, I guess, of uh, what posters were like. Many of them are kind of painterly. And then we get to this one and you'll see it's sort of the figures are there and then there's a very simple background and that actually reflects a movement that was started by the artist that uh, created this particular poster. His name was John Whitcomb. And um, he had come out of the sort of working in theaters and doing posters for theaters and such to doing um, more, um, work on posters and illustrations for magazines and advertisers. And um, he mostly worked with pretty young women. And uh, what he introduced was this idea of just using really simple elements with um, a very simple background, sort of changed the way posters were being done. Here are a couple others where that are recruiting women to join the military. Uh, on the left is one for the Army Nurse Corps. Um, and uh, something that was new and more of an enticement is that um, women that joined the Army Nurse Corps were offered the rank of a commissioned officer and paid $70 a month in pay. Um, and again, their education was paid for. On the right is um, a WAC poster that's uh, recruiting women to join the Army's Auxiliary, Auxiliary Corps. I know I'd have trouble saying that. Um, and women were required between the ages of 21 and 45. And often they re re were recruited to take the work of sort of clerical work that men were performing and it would free them up to actually be um, working, serving on the front, uh, able to fight. I want to talk a little bit about the motivation. Um, I mentioned that when the war started, uh, basically when uh, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, uh, the United States had to really gear up to be dealing with um, fighting a war on multiple fronts around the world. And uh, I mentioned also that um, many Americans weren't necessarily in favor of the war, so they actually had to um, undertake a campaign to convince Americans of the need for that war. And um, there was one thing that sort of played into their hands, um, and that was some of the atrocities that they were hearing about uh, coming out of Europe. Here is uh, a piece that was done by the artist Ben Sean, and uh, it features some um, French villagers 
and the message is, we French workers warn you, defeat means slavery, starvation, and death. Uh, so there was a campaign to convince Americans that Nazis truly were an evil enemy that had to be stopped. And uh, that's the reason they started up the um, Office of um, Wartime Information to undertake this campaign, recruited artists to make the artwork. And I have another uh, poster that's not in the exhibit, but it's one of the important ones, the only other one that Ben Chan did. Um, right here on the left-hand side. This was a particularly effective poster uh, that was made uh, to mark uh, one Nazi uh, atrocity that took place in Czechoslovakia. Uh, there were some um, rebels, I guess, uh, that were active in that area and they had actually taken out an attack on some Nazi leaders um, and succeeded and the Nazis decided that they needed to uh, teach a lesson. And so they essentially um, wiped out this particular village, killed all the men, shipped all the women away, and the children ended up in concentration camps or were killed. And uh, the town was no more. They literally obliterated it. And uh, the US government used those particular events, uh, particularly in this poster here to make that point that this was a brutal enemy that had to be stopped. Um, I think the poster on the right is one that certainly would have um, been noticed by Americans if you saw it in your local library or your post office, wherever it might be posted, because I think what's particularly effective about this is that it shows the shadow of the swastika um, running over these children that are just playing in their yard. So uh, the message here is that we have to support the war and buy war bonds so that we don't experience the same thing here on our own soil in America. You don't want your children to be threatened by the Nazis. The campaigns were particularly effective. It's interesting, uh, some statistics that uh, in 1942, 21% of people in America uh, believed that America should focus on fighting the Nazis. After this campaign, this, um, that number had risen to 40%. It gives you an idea how low the numbers were to start with, but this was really a pretty effective campaign to build support for the war effort. They also did studies to see what kind of posters were effective. And they found that um, those that appealed to the emotions were far more effective, and particularly those that included women and children. So you'll see that in a lot of posters as well. This is the other, actually it was a series of four posters that were created by Norman Rockwell. And, um, he created them um, in response to President Roosevelt's speech on January 6th in 1941, where he articulated the ide ideological aims of the war and appealed to Americans' most profound beliefs about liberty. Uh, and for each one, he identified freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Uh, these have been reproduced many, many times. Uh, in fact, in 1943, um, they made them into a series of war bond posters that ultimately raised $132 million. Part of the, the motivation also was to um, remind Americans that the soldiers that have already paid a sacrifice should not have done it in vain. Uh, this is one of the earliest posters that was made uh, right after America joined the war. And um, like a few others that I'll show you, um, they just were pointing out in Americans that, you know, don't forget, because the war lasted for a few years, don't forget the sacrifices that our soldiers have made and are making.
Here are a couple others. Um, one of my favorites is the one on the left-hand side, which was done by Victor Kepler, who was a commercial photographer um, that did a lot of work for cover photos for Saturday Evening Post, as well as advertising. And I want you to notice on this particular poster, uh, a couple things that people would have seen. First of all, you see the boy is hol holding what is undoubtedly his father's garrison cap. Around his neck is the Medal of Honor. And you can't miss it actually if you see the poster because it's quite large, but there are tears that are running down the boy's cheeks. Definitely this is one that appeals to the emotions. By war bonds, this boy has sacrificed, so you need to do your part. On the right is a different one. It shows a woman and her family, and this was done by um, a really actually important um, advertising photographer named Valentino Serra, who uh, was born in Italy and came here to the uh, US to make his mark. Um, and this one here, the message is really clear. She has made her sacrifice and she's asking somebody to at least give 10% of their pay. Uh, so, sort of guilting people into doing their part. Here are a couple others that have a slightly different emphasis. Uh, the one on the left, is, it's saying thinking of tomorrow. The, there are posters that are definitely future oriented. The one on the right, protect his future. Um, the one on the left is actually fairly early in the war. It dates from 1942, and the one on the right is 1944, when people are already starting to, starting to think past the war. And, uh, but they both convey the same message. You need to be thinking of family, thinking of your kids. And, uh, oh, I almost forgot. And this is a poster that I actually did not include in the exhibit, but I wanted to include in the talk tonight just because I thought it was, I, I really love the, uh, the imagery uh, and the message that it conveyed. But it was done by a gentleman by the name of Artist, Artist Hughes, who actually uh, was uh, a regular in Saratoga Springs. What he was particularly known for were his, um, his paintings of architecture, uh, and sort of local scenery. In fact, uh, he traveled around the world um, painting such things and was quite well known for that particular um, subject matter in his art. Another thing that the, uh, the posters did uh, were to make a couple points that are, are really crucial. And uh, the next series of posters we're gonna look at have to do with uh, the effort to get Americans to conserve goods. Uh, in this case here, the one on the left to actually have their own gardens and grow their own produce. Um, food, uh, many food items uh, were not readily available, but people could grow food. Uh, they didn't need to get, they didn't need to have food stamps. They could um, grow as much as they wanted. And um, by 1943, 20 million gardens were planted of these victory gardens. What I just wanted to point out in this poster is, is what are the images that are right there in the center? Yes, it's a garden, but you actually have two generations with the middle generation missing. You have a grandfather and a granddaughter, an older gentleman and a child. The adults are both missing from this picture. Um, the father perhaps serving at war, Maybe the mother is working in a factory, but it's very intentional, I think, that they chose these two um, age groups to include in this. And right in the center is the American flag. So the message is, it's patriotic for you to grow a garden. Um, on the poster on the right um, has to do with rationing, which was a really important part of uh, the home front experience. Um, families had to register for ration books. Um, and so the food was actually allotted in the beginning. Uh, each person was allotted 12 ounces of sugar per week. And you take your, um, your ration stamps to the store and exchange them for food go goods, um, whatever you could get at that point. Just because you had the stamps didn't always mean you could get the goods though. 
and people had to get very creative using all sorts of substitute materials uh, to try to make uh, recipes that would be palatable. Um, particular, that's why things like corn syrup and flavored gelatin uh, became part of the American diet. Uh, and women's uh, cookbooks and magazines were just full of recipes that were gonna help people figure out how to make uh, palatable food. Here are a couple other home front posters uh, on the left. We don't think about it much, but uh, people were encouraged to save their fat and basically return it to the meat dealer uh, because it was used in munitions. Um, on the right is one of my favorite posters in the exhibit, if not my absolute favorite. Um, and it depicts a woman who's carrying her packages and her groceries home. Uh, and what really makes the point is the artist included images of some soldiers marching in the background. She's saying, I'll carry mine. She's doing her part by not driving, not using up gasoline. And in this case here, what they were really concerned about was rubber tires. Uh, one of the first things that happened um, was Japan invaded in the southeast and wiped out essentially the supply of rubber for America. So it was uh, really hard to come by. So what they had to do is convince Americans not to drive uh, because then the tires that they had would last even longer, would free up the material to be used by the, uh, by the military. Uh, I mentioned Valentino Serra before. The, the poster, I'll carry mine, was also done by him. Um, here we have a couple more that have to do with uh, the rationing of goods and people doing their part. Um, here the woman's making the point that by not driving, you're actually helping to get her son home from his military service. And on the right is one that um, is not quite um, so emotional in nature. It's using a bit of humor um, and just sort of uh, making you think twice. Yeah, they're showing a, a, a gentleman that's driving alone. Um, he's not carpooling, which was important. Um, and because he's doing that, essentially, he is supporting Hitler. The message is really clear, because that's what the, the drawing is of the passenger uh, next to him. So in, in addition to um, making people feel guilty, uh, often they used humor to try to make their points. Um, the poster on the left is one that was actually made for the military, uh, getting soldiers to um, be thinking about some of the same things. Uh, the message in the circle there is food is ammunition, don't waste it. Um, the one on the right is, uh, speaks to some different issues. It shows uh, this uh, cartoon of a big burly guy, and it's saying that he needs to get recreation in addition to just working. It's going to make him healthier. This was done um, by guy, an artist that, according to the poster, is named H. Price. You may have seen in the e-blast I do where I did one of them that just had to do with him. Um, I couldn't find any information about the artist. I don't know whether it was a man or a woman, um, I just could not find any H. Price material except for the series of posters that he produced. Here they are. Um, they definitely are eye-catching, uh, and they show him uh, eating healthy food, uh, going to the doctor for a checkup, cleaning his clothes, wearing a mask, going to the dentist, uh, cleaning himself, being concerned about safety, not getting injured on the job, and also getting sleep. It's such a concise little body of material. I think it's really fascinating 
and I was so disappointed that I couldn't find anything more about the artist. Here's a poster done by an artist who actually is very, very well known. Uh, it was done by Will Eisner. And um, it's uh, part of a series of training posters that he did as well as other artists that were intended to try to make soldiers good soldiers. Um, and they use, he, here he's using one called Joe Dope, um, who is a slacker. He's somebody that just, just never does exactly what he's supposed to do. He doesn't clean his rifle. Um, he doesn't follow procedures. He's always doing less than is needed in order for a soldier to be effective. And uh, Will Eisner uh, had already been established as one of the leading comic illustrator um, in the United States. He started doing it when he was in high school in Brooklyn. And uh, in the 1930s, he created such characters as Harry Carey in the flame, and then uh, Doll Man, Uncle Sam, Wonder Man, Lady Luck, and uh, probably his most famous comic, which was The Spirit. In 1942, he was drafted into the army and uh, produced uh, um, all these um, cartoons that were aimed at trying to get soldiers to, to do things right. And there are dozens and dozens of them, and I've just included a few here in this collage uh, showing Joe Dope, Joe Dope just doing everything wrong, uh, not cleaning his weapon, driving a vehicle too fast and abusing it, uh, letting sand get into the, the motor. Um, he just does everything wrong. And they were, they were done in a humorous way, but they had a very serious intent, and that was to get soldiers to do things according to procedure so they could be effective. The other big message, in addition, in addition to giving money for war bonds, um, the recruiting posters, trying to get people to either join the military or go into the workforce, you have posters that are encouraging uh, people to um, conserve materials, grow gardens. There is another big one that there were many posters created for, and that was to get people to not share information loosely. Um, and we have a couple of illustrations here that uh, a couple posters that show the consequences of Americans not doing that. And that is that soldiers will be killed. That's the clear message. Here we have a couple that's lost their son. And then on the right, here we have a girl that's lost her father because people talked. There was a concern that there were enemy spies throughout America. And uh, so they wanted people to make sure they didn't share any information that might have come home from a soldier that was in their family uh, or any details about troop movements that they might know about. Um, because by sharing that sort of things, people would be jeopardizing national security and actually the lives of soldiers. Um, let's go to the next one here. Here are two that are certainly more ominous. Um, Someone Talked is a really, really large poster, um, and the graphic on it is definitely disturbing. Um, it was done by an artist named Frederick Seibel, who was born in Austria. I uh, went to school uh, there before he came to the United States. And he, like many of the other uh, illustrators of these posters, uh, served in the United States Army. And uh, in the little e-blast I sent out today, I asked whether people would know um, what else, what else he did, and yes, he later, after the war, he illustrated children's books, including Amelia Bedelia. I thought that was an interesting little tidbit. Uh, the one on the right was done by the Stetson Company, the Stetson Hat Company. Um, often you'll find that corporations would produce posters as well as the US government. Uh, magazines did it as well, state, local government as well. Here are two uh, exceptional posters, which sort of go against the general advice, which was to use posters that appeal to people's emotions. Uh, the one on the left is irony. 
Uh, it's an award for careless talk. You'll see it's being given out by the Nazi government. And um, the one on the right, uh, silence me surprise. This one is very eye-catching, but it's using humor to make the same point, which is to uh, keep your mouth shut. And actually that brings me to the last poster in um, my talk this evening. I put it in just sort of end on a little bit lighter note than the last two. Uh, this is actually a Canadian poster that's not in the exhibit, but I thought it was kind of fun um, because he's saying, keep on licking war saving stamps, they're full of vitamin D. Uh, 